And that is the Mamertine prison. Originally, there were no stairs leading down into the room, just the hole that you can see in the floor of the room above, and prisoners would have been lowered, probably thrown down into that small dark room below, either to await trial, or if they'd already had their trial and been found guilty, to await execution. And according to tradition, both Peter and Paul were held in this prison before they died. And the thing that made this small, dark, damp hole in the ground the highlight of my trip to Rome is the thought that it's possible, and I would even go so far as to say I think it is likely that it was from this very prison cell that we visited that Paul wrote the letter that we started to read a moment ago, the second letter of Paul to Timothy. It was probably written in this very prison cell that we now see on the screen. It's probably written towards the end of Paul's life and probably the last letter that he ever wrote. And one study Bible talking about this letter to Timothy uh, says this, that it, it is the last words, but says what Paul most wants Timothy to heed for the rest of his life and ministry, that's what's in this letter. Paul is taking the opportunity at the end of his life to write to Timothy and say, these are the things that are important for you to take notice of and to remember for the rest of your life and the rest of your ministry. And that same study Bible described it as the last word from a spiritual father. Now, I'm not suggesting that I have been or am a spiritual father uh, to David or to Michelle. Uh, David has often been known to comment on my advanced years and uh, <laughs> even at times to call me granddad. Um, but I'm not going to dwell on that. But it did seem appropriate that this last word from a spiritual father would be something that we look at today as both David and Michelle leave us and enter the rest of their life and ministry. This is not the end of their life or the end of their ministry. This is the next season that they are entering into. And so I thought it was very appropriate for us to look at this letter. There's so much in the letter that we could learn from, and I would commend it to both of you, both you, David, and Michelle, to take time to read this letter as part of your devotional reading in the coming days, because there's a lot in it that is about moving into another season of ministry, I think. But I want us to focus on one verse, uh, one from our Bible reading, and it's this, where Paul says to Timothy from his prison cell, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. First words are, for this reason. And in the previous verse, Paul has said, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. And because Paul remembers Timothy's sincere faith, he says, for this reason, because I know you have a sincere faith, and I just want to say exactly that same thing again to David and to Michelle. I've had the privilege of working with both of you quite closely now for five years. And I can say that I would use exactly that same phrase of your sincere faith. You've both been examples of sincere faith. Sincere in the sense that I can honestly say that in five years there's never been a single occasion where either of you has said something and I've been thinking inwardly, I'm not sure you mean that. It's never been an occasion where I've had any reason to doubt your sincerity, nor your faith, as you have both in your own unique ways been examples of what it means to trust God. And it's because I have seen in you both the same sincere faith that Paul had seen in Timothy that I can go on to say, to you two, what Paul says to Timothy, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you. Let's just think about that little phrase, the gift of God. My guess is I don't need to say too much about spiritual gifts. You both demonstrated the gift of God that is in you. 
Michelle, your works of compassion, your pastoral care, your passion and campaigning for justice are just some of the gifts of God that we've seen in you. David, your evangelistic heart, your ability to communicate with children and young people as easily as you do with adults, your passion for worship and your pursuit of the presence of Jesus are just some of the gifts we've seen in you. And for both of you, that spiritual gift of leadership, your gifting to set direction, to inspire others, to lead by example, we've, we've seen those things. So all I want to say at this point is remember that they are gifts. It is the gift of God that is in you. It's absolutely fine to be pleased with a gift, but we never have reason to be proud of a gift because the gift says more about the giver than it says about the one to whom it's given. So these are gifts that you've been given. And there is a fundamental principle which Jesus himself spoke, which was freely you have received freely give. You have received gifts, you have used them, continue to give to others. But Paul also talks about this gift of God as being in Timothy through the laying on of my hands. And again, don't want to dwell on this, but I do want to pick up one thought because this is not the only time that Paul says something like this to Timothy. In fact, in his first letter to Timothy, he says almost exactly the same thing. When he says, do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. And Paul links the laying on of hands and prophecy and encourages Timothy to think back and remember the prophetic words that had been spoken over him. And that's what I want to say again to you two. I believe that times of change and times of transition such as you are both entering into, and when I say both, that includes the whole front row here, of course. Well, up to this point, the Ritchie family. Times of change and transition, such as you are entering into, are good times to look back and remember the prophetic words that have been spoken over you in the past. Maybe words that were spoken over you when you were first set apart for a leadership role in the church. For you, David, when you were ordained in the Pentecostal church, or you, Michelle, when you were ordained in the Church of England, or at other key times, remember some of the prophetic words that have been spoken over you in the past. And this is, a belief, I believe, is a time for you to remember them, to reflect on them, and to pray into them again and ask, how are they going to be worked out and fulfilled in this next season of your life and ministry? Now, because this is Dave and Michelle's final Sunday, I'm addressing a lot of what I'm saying to them. But guess what? Everything that I'm saying to them is just as applicable to every one of us as it is to them. And that's especially true when we come to this third and final element of the verse where Paul says, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. So I am speaking it to David and Michelle, but I'm speaking it to all of us. This is the exhortation of God. Let's make an obvious point to start off with. When we talked about the gift of God, well, that focuses on the fact that it's God who gives the gifts. When we talk about the laying on of hands, which we did, that focuses on other people because they're the ones who lay hands on you. But this is something that Timothy has to do himself. And therefore, it's something for us. This is something we have to do ourselves. God gives us gifts. Other people may be involved through the laying on of hands and prophecy. But it is us, we who are responsible for fanning the gifts into flame not something we ask God to do. It's not something we ask others to do for us. This is something we have to do for ourselves. This is something you have to do for yourself. Fan into flame the gift of God. The image is a simple one. It's the image of fire. I know from having been in your home and experienced the warmth of it on one occasion, you have a wood burner in your home. So you understand about fire and heat. 
And Michelle, I'm sure you remember our impromptu time one evening gathered around the fire pit in our garden. So I have memories of both of you that are associated with fire. But those are not the images of fire that I want us to have in mind right now. Not the wood burner or the fire pit. The image that I want us to have in mind is more the blacksmith's forge. So if you wanted a modern image, you could think, of course, of the furnace in the steelworks, which is just that little bit bigger and bolder than the blacksmith's forge. So keep one of those images in mind, either the furnace in the steelworks or the blacksmith's forge. And having got one of those images in mind, let me just pause for a moment and remind you and remind all of us of the science lessons that we had at school, that in order for there to be fire, there needs to be three things, which are, of course, oxygen, heat, and fuel. That's right. And where fire is being used either in a furnace or in a blacksmith's forge, there needs to be a constant flow of oxygen, a constant flow of air, in order for the fire to be hot enough to do the job that needs to be done. And so using the image that was probably more the one that was in Paul's mind, the bellows that you can see there, highlighted with that arrow on the left, they were the means by which a constant supply of air fanned the flame on the forge. And so when Paul urges Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God that is in him, it's as if he's saying, just keep those bellows pumping air. You need a constant supply of air if the fire is going to be hot enough to do the job that it's intended to do. What does that actually mean? What does it mean this image of fanning into flame the gift of God that is in us. God's given us a gift. We've acknowledged some of what those gifts are. We all have different gifts. But what does it mean to fan into flame the gift of God? Well, I just want to give three quick suggestions of what it might look like to fan into flame the gift of God. The first thing is a very obvious one, and it's this. Keep using the gift. Use the gift that God has given you. I know that's obvious, but it does need to be said, doesn't it? Having a gift is great, but you do need to use it. A few years ago, someone suggested to me that it might help me with a recurring back problem if I took up Pilates. So I went onto Amazon, and uh, I checked my Amazon account this week, and it was actually on the 25th of March in 2008, about 16 years ago that I bought the complete book of Pilates for men and the DVD Pilates for men. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Anne and I moved house and I found both the book <laughs> and the DVD. The observant among you may spot that the DVD is still in its wrapper. <laughs> And the spine of the book has no sign of a crease on it, as if it has never been opened and is almost in the same condition that it was 16 years ago. Um, when I bought it, I'm very disappointed that there have not been any benefit to me at all. <laughs> and I, you know, were I not outside of the return window on Amazon, I would send them back with a complaint that they have not helped at all. <laughs> or maybe there is something about having the gift is not enough. You actually have to use it. You know what gifts God has given you. We all perhaps know what gifts God has given us. Fanning into flame the gift is just about using it. Don't neglect it, but use it. Second suggestion is this. Hang out with other people who are using the same gift. There are a number of things from the Bible that I could use to make this point. In the Old Testament, you read about the school of the prophets or the company of the prophets. In the Gospels, Jesus sent his disciples out in twos. In Acts, we read that there were uh, prophets and teachers gathered together. Uh, lots of things that we could look at in the Bible which suggest that people used to hang out with other people who had the same gift. And there's something about hanging out with other people who have the same gifts that is what the Bible talks about as iron sharpening iron. And so in terms of fanning into flame the gift that you've got, Find other people who have the same gift and learn from one another. 
And then my third suggestion is what it might mean to fan into flame the gift of God that is in you is to pass it on to others. One of the best ways to get better at doing something is to teach others how to do it. When I was at school, I studied classical Greek. And then when I was at theological college, I studied New Testament Greek. And I learned enough to pass the exams. And then, to be honest, didn't remember very much. After I left college, I didn't use it very much. But then a few years later, I was asked if I would teach New Testament Greek at a Bible college. And because they were absolutely desperate and they pleaded, um, I agreed to do so. And so I was the archetypal one chapter ahead of the student's teacher. Uh, because I'd studied it before, it did come back a little bit more readily. And so for five years, I taught New Testament Greek. And I learned far more, and I've remembered far more since I taught it to others than I ever did when I was just studying it for myself. Because there's something about passing things on to others that embeds it in us in a much deeper way. And so, fanning into flame the gift of God that is in us is about using the gift. It's about hanging out with others who are using the same gift and passing it on to others. And so, David and Michelle and the rest of the Richie family, as you move on and enter this next season of life and ministry, and for all of us, as we also enter the next season of life and ministry, because there is a real sense that over these next two to three weeks, Warfield Church is entering a new season of life and ministry. As David starts a new work and some of you choose to go with him, that is also the start of a new season of life and ministry. So whether you're moving away to Cornwall, whether you're staying local, whether you're going to be with David, whether you're staying here in Warfield Church, this word from God, I believe, is for all of us. Fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. And if I could just address it to those of us who will be staying here in Warfield Church, for those of us who will be here with three full-time ministers all leaving within a couple of weeks of each other, this is definitely a time for all of us to be using the gift of God that is in us, to be fanning into flame the gift of God that is in us. We will all need to dig deep, rediscover what God has put into us, those gifts that he's given us, and then use them, hang out with other people who are using them, and teach others how to use those gifts. Every one of us will need to do that. And we'll also need to raise up a new generation of folk who will eventually take the baton from us and pass on to them what we have learned so that we're equipping and empowering the next generation to fan into flame the gift of God that is in them. And so David, Elizabeth, the rest of the family, Michelle, as you go, I want to give you this word, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. And for those of us who are staying, either here in Warfield Church or in a new work, fan into flame. Keep those bellows next to the forge pumping. Fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, this word written... 2,000 years ago in a damp, dark, cold prison cell comes to us today with as much life and energy as when it was first written. And we pray that we would be diligent in receiving this word and responding to it, knowing the gifts that you've given us that we would choose today as we all enter into a new season of life and ministry, we pray that we would be diligent in fanning into flame the gift of God that is in us. We ask it, Lord Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen.